Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Man Cave 4301 podcast. I'm your host, Big Kev. Just before we get into this episode, just want to remind you that I am on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Go over to those platforms, give me a like, give me a share, uh, share this podcast far and wide. Um, just so you guys know, I'm still learning about stuff and making mistakes. So uh, my next guest, her audio is going to be really good, but you won't be able to hear me too well because it was uh, just residual sound. But um, I, I worked out what it was. I had the power board too close to the mixer and it created a buzzing noise that I couldn't figure out what it was until after the podcast. So my audio is a little bit crap, but uh, but my next guest her audio is going to be spot on. So let's get into it. Our next guest today was in her early 20s, uh, a young mother, and uh, she woke up one morning and she just wasn't feeling quite right. She was eventually diagnosed with a spinal cavernoma. And we're here today to talk to her about her journey in the last 13 years of um, being in a wheelchair and the trolls and tribulations that come with it and uh, also just dealing with the spinal cavernoma. And uh, I'd like to welcome our next guest, Stacey Jackson. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming and joining me on the podcast today. Um, I think your, your story will be really good for people to to learn new things with um, processes and whatnot that you went through when you were diagnosed with it is co- spinal cavernoma cavernoma that's yeah. the one <laughs> spinal or cavernoma. transverse myelitis depends which doctor you ask i prefer the first one yeah because <laughs> i can pronounce it yeah <laughs> but thank you very much for coming on um let's go a little bit before this happened and so you were like 21 years old, around about that age, yeah. and uh, and it all sort of happened. So can you walk us through sort of how it started and the progression of it? Yeah. Um, okay, so I was a young mum. I had a three-year-old and a nine-month-old at the time. Um, and I was actually on maternity leave with my son. And I woke up on a Friday morning and I just had a sore back. Um, it was just like that sort of niggling injury, you know, and I thought, oh, I just need to go to the chiropractor or something. Um, and it just sort of got worse on the Saturday. I woke up and I had um, my tingles sort of in one leg. Um, and I thought, okay, maybe it's a bit more serious, like a pinched nerve, you know, I'll see how it goes and whether or not I need to go to hospital. Um, I wasn't really in a very good relationship at the time. Um, and so my partner, uh, I mean, he sort of relied heavily on me doing all the parenting. Um, and I remember we went out for dinner with his family on the Saturday night and I had to change my son's nappy and I, I took him to the bathroom and I was standing up and um, I just sort of fell to the floor like my knees went weak. And I thought that was really strange. And um, after that, I, I got this feeling in my legs like they were twitching and I just couldn't stop moving them. So I was just sort of pacing back and forth when we were out for dinner. Everyone was like, are you okay? And I sort of didn't really know what was going on, but I could just get this sensation of like an electrical current going on in my legs and I had to keep moving. Um, and it, yeah, it just got worse from there. Sunday, um, more pain in my back, um, intensity in my legs, my feet were twitching. Um, and Sunday night was pretty bad. I don't think I got any sleep. Um, during the night I realised that my stomach had blown up. Like I looked like I was about five or six months pregnant and I didn't realise that I was actually retaining urine. I couldn't go to the toilet. Um, so that's when I knew that there was something serious wrong and I spent the night on the floor in the shower. Um, and my partner didn't drive at the time so we had to get up at about five in the morning and I was going to drive him to work. And I'd almost lost the ability to walk. I remember crawling around on the floor trying to make my son a bottle um, just to get him in the car so that we could go to hospital. And I ended up calling his mum to come and get us um, because I couldn't drive. I just couldn't risk you know, putting the kids in the car and being able to use my legs enough. Um, and so she drove me to hospital that morning and then took the kids to daycare. And by the time I arrived, um, it was probably about 8am, they had to wheel me in in a wheelchair um, 
and put a catheter in straight away and drain my bladder because it was just enormous. Um, and they did some tests and stuff over that day and they pretty much came back and said that they thought I had MS. Um, and I didn't know a whole lot about that at the time, except that it was degenerative and a lot of people die fairly young from that. So I freaked out. Um, multiple sclerosis. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah. Okay. Um, and so they rang my mum and she came up and stayed with me and they transferred me to the PA hospital in Brisbane because they have a spinal unit there. And um, I was pretty much in the main hospital for about three weeks. Um, I lost all feeling and function from about the belly button down. And they just didn't know what was wrong with me. So they did every test under the sun and eventually they came back with transverse myelitis, which is basically inflammation in the spinal cord um, caused generally by some sort of virus from anything to the simple cold to HIV. So they test you for everything. Um, they couldn't find any virus whatsoever that had done it. Um, basically what happens is you get a virus and then your immune system attacks um, itself, basically. So it attacks the myelin um, and at the time that was in the spinal cord. So the issue was in the spinal cord. So I had all this inflammation um, from about, I don't know, T6 um, down and I even, you could even see it on my back, like when I took my top off, you could see I had like a dinosaur back and my spine was sort of, yeah, swollen on the outside. It was really bizarre. Um, and I had this feeling like I was wearing a corset around my waist, which is typical of transverse myelitis. So um, that's what they said I had. Um, they sent me down to the spinal unit and I ended up staying in there for seven months doing rehab. Um, just learning to sort of dress myself and toilet and shower and do all that kind of stuff I had to learn again. Um, I did get up on my feet. I can walk a little bit, um, but I have to be hanging on to something or using like a walker or something like that because I've got one good leg and one dodgy leg <laughs> that doesn't want to cooperate. Um, so yeah, it was a big process um, and lots of things happened in my personal life over that time that really changed how I dealt with things as well. So yep. it's a long story. So you, you describe it as pins and needles, like yep. just a normal, like you've been sitting on your foot for too long. and Yeah, electrical goes. current, yep. um, like spasm, which I now know to be sort of spasm. You get like a, a sharp zap and then your leg flicks out or something like that. Yeah, um, oh wow. The intense pain that I was feeling was nerve pain. Um, so it can either be like a burning sensation, like you're on fire, or this icy sensation, um, which I get both. So it's hard to know whether you've actually lost feeling or whether it's nerve pain. It's like your mind plays tricks on you, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Sending wrong signals yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So you say that the, the, the morning after you, you had to crawl on the floor to get stuff done. Yeah. How alarming was that for you? Um, like, I mean, there was no sort of ambulance involved or no anything. It was sort I of was. I'm one of those people that um, doesn't like to make a big deal out of it, and I kind of just thought. I mean, this is we're talking back in the days before. I mean, I didn't have a computer at home, so we didn't have smartphones. The internet wasn't, you know, just yeah. at your fingertips to Google things and freak yourself out. But I kind of just thought... <laughs> probably, um, that was probably good. Yeah, thing. I kind of just <laughs> thought, oh, I've just pinched a nerve and they'll be able to fix it. Right. Um, I really didn't think too much more other than that until they said, yeah, it could be MS. So you're an optimist. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'd never heard of anything like that happening before. Like, I didn't even know it existed. You're really ignorant, I think, to stuff like that until you know someone or, you know, something like that happens to you as well. So I, yeah, just didn't, didn't think anything of it. Thought it was nothing. Yeah. Um, the amount of people that asked me, like doctors and nurses, when they're trying to diagnose me, whether I had an epidural with my son really freaked me out. Um, I didn't, but that kind of stressed me to think, what, nine months later, you could have some sort of episode where you lose function? Mm. Like, um, that was a bit scary. But yeah, they just didn't didn't know what was wrong with me. It was a fairly rare case. So... Okay. Yeah. So, obviously, having to learn how to do things all over again, um, 
must have been taxing emotionally for you. Yeah. So what what sort of things were going through your mind while you're going through these processes? I think for me, like you said before, I, I'm an optimist. So even when I found out what was wrong, as I started to get little bits of movement back, like I remember, um, I think it must have been two or three weeks into hospital and my sister was visiting me and we were watching TV one night and I could just wiggle my big toe and we freaked out. We were like, you know, how's this message getting through right to the end of my body? You know, something's coming back. So um, that was really bizarre. And then I slowly just got little things back, like I could roll my leg out and back and then I could sort of lift my foot up and down and it just gradually came back. Um, and doctors will always tell you if you have a spinal cord injury, it takes like two years for your body to fully sort of recover from all of the trauma basically that your, your body's put through. So um, even when I went home to my kids, I look back now and think, oh, there's so much I couldn't do that I can do now. Um, like your ab function and just being able to pick something up off the floor and yeah. that type of thing. You're all, you're really weak right at the beginning and you always feel like you're going to come out of your chair or you don't really have a sense of space. Um, so it takes a long time to get used to that, that kind of thing. It's, yeah. it's hard in the beginning. Um, so how did that affect your mental health? I, mean, I don't know. I guess I just kept thinking, oh, it's all going to come back one day. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so it was just onwards and upwards. It was just yeah, do what was I can. Just, it was I've just got to work at this. I've just got to do the physio, do what they tell me and keep going. One day I'll be fine. Just you know, it'll go away. It. Yeah. And I think um, my relationship situation at the time really helped with that too. Um, like I said, I was not in a good relationship with my kid's father. Um, and I ended up breaking up with him when I was in hospital. Um he just couldn't handle the kids and I sort of thought this is going to be my life now like I already did everything for them and he's not even going to help me now so I need to get out while I can um and then while I was in there I ended up meeting my husband um who's also in a chair so we were then together and ended up getting married um for 13 years uh, that's just recently ended so yeah. um I guess in a sense because he was in a chair too and um, we kind of were doing our rehab together and there were lots of young people in there at the time. We ended up making like really close friends. It was kind of like um, you were back at school or like a boarding school situation right. where you were with your friends every day and you yeah. slept with them in the same room. Like there were four people to a room and um, I had a young girl in, in the room with me and, and we got on and all the boys would run amok in their room, <laughs> um, blast their like music and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> and drink on weekends and just go out and be crazy. But it was kind of just, I don't know, I, I never thought that I wouldn't get my legs back and that things wouldn't just be normal again. Yeah. And then as time sort of progressed, it was like, oh, well, this is my life now. So you just get on with it. Yeah. Um, well, great attitude. Yeah. I it mean, could be a hell of a lot worse. Oh, absolutely. I mean, a lot of people don't, uh, they just, don't have that part of their brain that just well, I shouldn't say part of the brain but they just don't yep. have that uh, that mentality which is yeah you know something that needs to be taught to some people and and for you just to have that is, is amazing like uh, uh, must have helped you so much through the last 13 years it would be incredible yeah you know instead of some people would sit on the couch and dwell on it and and sort of just waste away yeah you know, and, and there were people like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. That yeah, just didn't didn't cope well with it. Um, but yeah, just it was just my life. And like mm. I said, there were other people in there that were um, way worse off than I was. And I was just thankful that my hands worked fine, um, and I was able to still be a mum to my kids. And it didn't affect that at all to me. You know, it's just like, well, I still look normal, and I still am the same. I'm just in a chair yeah so y you just get used to it yeah uh, so 13 years uh, so well, I don't want to go too much into your personal life but both partners being in in chairs did that have its own tribulations as well like so it was only the partner that I met in hospital yeah. that was in a chair yeah both of us um, 
I don't know, it was kind of like it was just normal because we were both in a chair, we both had nerve pain, we both had the same sort of issues that we had to deal with day to day. Um, so we understood each other. Mm. And the one thing that I've noticed now since being single is um, the insecurity that I have just about being down here, <laughs> um, which I've never thought of before because in the past when we would go out, we were both sort of at the same right. level and I don't know, you'd sit down or you'd wheel around the shops or whatever and you could talk to each other and be face to face. But for me now, it's like everybody is at butt level and I have to look up to have a conversation with people. Right, okay. And if you ever go into a, um, a crowded room like where everybody's standing, you feel like a child because you're down so low. And oh. a lot of people I find um, if you're out with somebody I would say like that's able-bodied. So if my, I'm out with my sister or my mum, a lot of people will talk to them instead of talking to me as though I can't speak for myself. Um, and you kind of think, you know, there's nothing wrong with me mentally. So, I'm just down here. <laughs> so people wouldn't ask them questions about you, would they? Yeah, While sometimes. you were sitting there? Yeah. What? Yep. That's insane. Yeah. Like as though it's it's society as well. Like if you want to go to a concert or even the movies, I have two kids. So anywhere I go, they give you like a carer seat. So it's the wheelchair and one seat next to you. And I'm forever going, well, I've got two kids and neither of them are my carers. I'm their carer. So how do you work that out? Yeah. You know, it's like they expect that you can't look after yourself. You can't be independent yeah. oh, um, wow. if you're in a wheelchair. And it was a big thing for me to sort of advocate that and get that out there that you can be independent, you can be, you know, you can live a completely normal life and still be in a chair or still have a disability of some sort. Um, so yeah, it's, and I think my kids are really sensitive about people staring at me, whereas it doesn't bother me, but they sort of go, oh, look, you know, mum, he's staring at you getting your chair yeah. out of the car or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but most of the time it's, it's just, got your back, yeah, it's you just know? curiosity. Like people are just yeah. watching what you're doing, not necessarily, you know, staring at you. Um, mm. But yeah, it's just, a, I think society as a whole have a, um, an ignorant outlook on disabilities um, and, and, you know, what makes people different because sometimes they're not different at all mm. um, and they're exactly the same. But no, I mate, mean, all look at the, the whole situation with this Caden kid, you know. Yes. You know, like, just it should be, we should be teaching our kids younger. Like, schools should be doing something in their cu curriculum to to combat this. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's, uh, we're, not, we're not getting to the root of it, are we? Like, we need to be starting our kids younger. Yeah. Um, understanding. And all that sort of stuff, but you don't sort of seem to see it in the in, in the schools. No. So, and we've got a massive bullying problem now. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I've always had a positive experience in schools. Um, so I'm not working at the moment, but I was working as a teacher aide. Oh, okay. um, and I'd do primary and high school. I enjoy high school more because you get to interact with the kids. But, yeah, yeah. you know, um, the amount of kids that would just come up to me and be like, oh, hey, miss, what happened to you? Or, you know, can you pop a wheelie? And yeah. they'll just sort of ask you <laughs> random questions like, yeah. how do you drive? Can I, you know, come down and watch you get your chair in the car and that sort of thing? And I, I like that. I embrace that because I think, mind, yeah, they the just want to know. Yeah. Um, and they're not afraid to ask, which is a lot better for me than some adults who will, you know, just direct questions about me to whoever I'm with. Yeah. Um, because I think that shows that they're a lot more open to it these days. Um, and so they should be, you know. Um, Do you think it's the genera different generation? Like, the kids are more curious now? Or? I think kids just, um, they grow up using technology and I, I honestly think they've just got more balls to ask stuff <laughs> yeah. because I watch my kids and the messages that come back and forth between their friends and I think, you know, these keyboard warriors, like they will say anything <laughs> over text message or, you know, on yeah. Instagram or whatever. And I'm like, would they really say that in person? But I think these days a lot of them do yeah. because that's just how they talk. So, social media, I mean, it's yeah. good for it. Like, I mean, we're both on this, uh, the uh, a page. Yeah. Uh, uh, together Facebook, and yep. that it's like some people just just no filter or yep. just 
some people just don't know don't know how to interact with other people. Like, yeah, and exactly. Even, even over the internet, it's so awkward sometimes. Well, they just want to stir the pot. Yeah, and you yeah, think yeah. in person. Would they sit around a table with a no. group of people and, and do that? Because I wouldn't know how to take somebody like that. Yeah. You know? Because, um, I mean, that's ex like if you put if you put someone on fa uh, on social media in a real world situation and say, yeah. I want you to talk to these people the way you talk to them on social media, I'd be sitting here with cards with gifts on them. Yeah. Like, I know. like memes. Like, Using your phone. Like, 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 I'm bad for it. Eh? Like, yeah. I, 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 I have a lot of conversations just with gifts just <laughs> it's insane but yep. uh yeah I, I think i think social media has destroyed that for us a little bit that, that personal thing it's uh, changed how they interact with each other yeah and in some ways it's good but i think in a lot of ways it's bad yeah um so i don't know see what the future holds it's yep. gonna be an interesting generation <laughs> oh tell me about it yeah i hate to see what my kids are growing up with Yep. But that's that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different podcast. Exactly. So um, going forward, are you just keeping up with the stuff? Is Because like, you've had a couple of relapses. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. yeah. So that's the tricky part. Um, the first one that I had, which was about three and a half years ago, um, wasn't so bad. And I lost function, but I didn't lose any feeling or anything like that. And... Um, I was in hospital for nine weeks. I was lucky enough to go back to the spinal unit at the PA and get full on rehab there. Um, and I ended up coming out of it, walking better, doing everything better than when I went in. Um, Cause the type of condition that I've got, I think if I was to do intense physio all the time that I could progressively get better. Um, but it's just a time and a money issue. Like mm -hmm. who has the money to spend on exercise physiologists that cost $160 an hour, you yep. know. Um, the NDIS has been great for that. Um, and I'm in the process of getting a lot more physio now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just gonna be an ongoing thing. And this time when I went into hospital, um, it was a lot more severe than what it has been. So that was tough. And I, I don't think I dealt with that emotionally um, quite the way that I have in the past. Did you, that was sort of two steps back yeah. and you just thought, oh, it, it, is this going to get worse or? It was too soon, I think. Um, I'd gone 10 years and then had a relapse and then it was only like three and a half years right. and having one. Um, the one that I had three and a half years ago, the kids were a fair bit younger and um, my ex, his mum lived two doors down for us. So she was a great help in like being able to run them to school and pick them up and do all that sort of thing while I wasn't gone, um, while I was gone. But this time, um, just being that my kids were a lot older um, and the situation that we're in, my daughter's got mental health problems at the moment. She has had mental health problems for the last couple of years. And um, so last year I took the whole year off work and I was um, basically just, just helping her, getting her to an alternative learning school. She's not suited for mainstream um, because of her anxiety and stuff like that. So um, I had taken on this really big role of, of um, caretaker for her and then to leave and go into hospital and sort of give that to somebody else, it didn't really work for anybody. Um, and that's when my husband ended up sort of breaking up with me and I had to discharge early from hospital and finish my rehab at home. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard just before Christmas. Um, Why does all this stuff happen before Christmas? I know, like it was November and um, yeah, I, I just, I was like, I can't stay in hospital. Um, I was at the Gold Coast University Hospital and my parents are in the Redlands. So uh, my sister and my brother, um, who were doing everything they could to help, but it was just impossible with work and everything um, to get the kids to school and stuff like that. So I just had to discharge from hospital and take them to mum and dad's. Um, so it's just been like a slow, a much slower process recovering this time than I did last time. And I think it's been a lot emotionally too, just because, you know, of the breakup and having to deal with all of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and moving and not having, you know, the stability that you used to. Um, but I think the last month has been really good for me and 
physically I'm progressing quite well um, and having physio and stuff like that and my physio thinks that I do all of this homework with doing all of my exercises and stuff but sometimes on slack and I don't and it's just coming back on its own <laughs> which I appreciate um, so yeah it's just going to be a, a process like in six yeah. months time who knows so still the optimist yeah that's good always. always I don't think there's any other way but each to their own yeah <laughs> The kids. Yeah. So how, in the last 13 years, uh, has it affected the kids? What, what sort of, what sort of, they would have had to grow up pretty fast in the regards to um, home uh, domestication and yeah. all that sort of stuff. So yeah. how'd that work out for them? Um, my son was good because by the time I got out of hospital, he was 14 months. So he was able to sort of string sentences together and climb up on my lap and just sit there without falling off or anything like that. So he learned that very quickly. Um, you know, if we're going down a hill, you lean back. And if we're going up a hill, you got to lean forward. And I'm pretty much squashing him to get up the hill. Um, but my daughter took it a lot harder because she was three. So she kind of um, went backwards a little bit in her behaviour and, and that kind of thing, um, being that my ex and I had separated at the time as well and they went to live with Nana and Grandad and they got spoilt rotten and then, you know, mum came out of yeah, hospital yeah. and, yeah, I'm like, I have all these rules and um, <laughs> so structure was kind of tricky for her but um, she used to play on the fact that I couldn't catch her mm. in the chair if she was in trouble um, and I'd try and put her, you know, like on the timeout spot or something like that and she wouldn't go and sit there so um, I had to improvise and you know, I remember one night she was outside and she wouldn't come inside for dinner. Um, so she went, ran up the hill so that I couldn't get her. So I just locked the door and locked her outside. And within seconds, she panicked and she's banging <laughs> on the door. I'll come inside now, mum. But yeah, I think you just you just have to learn to go with it. And they, they just got used to it eventually. It was a novelty to push me around and that sort of thing. Um, they thought I was cool when they started school because all their friends wanted to talk to me and stuff. Oh, it's like the okay. total opposite now. You know, oh, mum, really? don't come to school. Uh, you know, oh, I don't know you. Yeah. <laughs> that type of thing. Though, but like, yeah, it's what pretty normal. What do I need to do with my parents? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my parents aren't cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm waiting for that. <laughs> and my son hates the questions like, oh, why is your mum in a wheelchair? Because he can't remember all the medical terms and he just freaks oh, out. Okay. So he's like, oh, I don't know. You know, don't ask me questions. Um, so he kind of freaks out a bit, but my daughter's pretty good with, you know, explaining everything to everybody. Um, so, yeah, it's, they've just adapted. They think it's normal, so normal that they don't want to help me put my chair in the car or they're like, oh, why can't you do it yourself? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, so normal that, yeah, they're like, oh, mum, you know, never want to help me out, too involved in their own lives. Yeah, but, okay. It's, you need to get one of those roof hoists. I know. That's, yeah. The only problem with that is your chair gets wet in the rain. I mean, unless oh, they've course, yeah. developed some sort of cover now, which they probably have, but I remember them offering me that when I was first in hospital. They're like, oh, your shoulders are going to get sore and, you know, you're putting a baby in and out of the back car seat and stuff. We'll, we'll fund one for you. And I was just like... That's so lame. I'm not driving around. I'm like 22 years old. I'm not driving around looking like an old person with this wheelchair up on the roof. Like it's the only place I look normal when I'm in the car, you know. So I was like, I'm not getting that. <laughs> too cool. Too cool for that. But um, I don't know. You just get used to it. It's so easy putting the chair in the car. It's, I don't even think about it now. It's in there within 30 seconds. So, you know, it's just one of those things. Yeah. So 13 years. What sick tricks can you do in your chair? Nothing really, Nothing really. <laughs> I, other than a bit of a wheelie. Um, but yeah, I was too cool in hospital to go to wheelchair skills. I was like, no, nah, I'm going to walk. So what difference does it make? I don't need okay. to learn how to drop down gutters and all that fancy stuff. I'll just stand up and pull my chair down the gutter and then get back in it, <laughs> which I totally do, by the way. I don't go down gutters backwards. Oh, really? No. Oh, no. not even forwards? No. Okay. If you go forwards, you'll come out of your chair. Um, you've got to go backwards and put the big wheels down first but I mean I'm getting a little bit more adventurous with some stuff but um I don't know I'm just like I'd rather just stand up and pull it down and yeah, get yeah, back okay. into it and then people look at you and think oh, okay she can stand uh, up why can't she walk <laughs> yeah I can imagine throws all sorts of questions out there 
something going on here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All the authorities. <laughs> yep. Yep. I've actually had someone in no. Woolworths, yeah, in the supermarket, you know, when you're in the veggie section, like how it's all sort of laid out. And I stood up one day to grab something and I had this young guy yell out, just, oh, we're going to call Centrelink. She can stand. And what? I just turn around and I'm like, what? What do you even say to that? Like, it's one of those memes that you see, you know, and you think, so how do people... that guy acts like he does online. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we found one. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, that kind of shocked me a little bit. But That's crazy. Yeah, I do get people in the supermarket all the time saying, oh, let me know if you want, you know, me to get something down for you. And I'm like, oh, it's okay. I can stand up and get it anyway. But people are just helping out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you do get the odd person like that that will freak out when you stand up. And we, well, I'm not going to put it into a demographic. I want to ask which part of town it was in, but that's that's crazy. I can't believe someone would call something like that out. Not in a part of town I would have thought they would. I think yeah. it was in Carindale. Um, uh, no, I work in Carindale every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> Some special think, people out there. Yeah, I think it's changed a lot since I was there. Like I'm talking 12 years ago or something yeah. now. Oh, but um, right. okay. so early it on. was yeah, it was it was a bit it's more still, upper class back still, then. But still in your early 20s and yeah, and people calling out garbage like that. Yeah, that's insane. It's a crazy world. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it, it's getting more crazy. Yeah. Um, or old people yelling at me when I pull into a disabled car park, oh. like particularly in the car that I drive and if I've got the music cranking, they just see like a young person yes. um, and go, oh, what are you doing in that, you know, spot? And I just go, I've got a permit. And they're like, it doesn't matter if you've got a permit, that's for the person that's disabled. And I'm like, dude, wait till I get out of the car, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then they shut up. But even some of them still, apologize? not not really. No, no. The, sometimes the they just sort of walk away. Yeah. Um, or they'll, yeah, take the total opposite end of it and just go, oh, you're too young to be in a wheelchair. And I'm like, hey, it doesn't discriminate <laughs> based on age or what you look like. Or, you know, I've had people say to me, oh, you're too pretty to be in a wheelchair. I'm like, what does that even mean? What? Yeah, or I'm so glad to see you out and about today. And I sort of go, am I supposed to hide in my house because I'm in a wheelchair? Like, people oh, have some God. strange ideas. But, oh, yeah, it's that whole communication thing, isn't it? Like yeah. We just don't know how to communicate with each other these days. Yeah, and it's ignorance too. Like I said, if you've yeah. never ex had to experience it or you don't know anybody, you just don't think about it like that. Mm. Um, I think that's why I put that post on Facebook. Uh, did you see that and some of the comments Which one? that I said? So I put pictures of myself in the chair and I kind of oh, said, you know, like in terms of dating, is this of, a yeah, deal yeah. breaker or, you know, like what do people think of that? Because yeah. I've never had to worry about that before um and i got mostly good responses but yeah. there were a few there that kind of shocked me a little bit i was like okay interesting mm. um but yeah everybody has their own opinion about various things and what they want from a partner i guess so mm. each to their own Man, some people yeah it, it, it makes you wonder how angry with themselves they are to just just have that hate in them, yeah. To just to force onto somebody else that's asking a genuine question. Like I mean, there was no malice in the question. Yeah. You know why can't? Um, Sometimes I think it's better like if it's not if it's not nice, it's better left unsaid. Mm. But I guess everybody has their own opinion and thinks, well, oh, well, I mean, if I think something of it that's going to start a conversation, then I'll say it, whether it's good or bad. Considering the group that we're in yes which is a singles group you would it's a good way of weeding out the assholes it, it definitely <laughs> is i haven't blocked anybody yet but i can see that lots of people do that to each other so yeah. it's obviously an ongoing issue and it's definitely an option yes <laughs> it gets too bad yeah well i don't think i've got any more questions it's i think it's all out there yeah it's done yeah um thank you so much for coming in and telling no the worries. story and and, I, uh, and I, I have no doubt that somebody else listening to this will will get something out of it for sure um thank you for your candidness and, and your honesty and and talking us through what you've been through it's been good um i wish you all the best in the future i hope things get better and thank you you can uh get out of that chair a bit more and and yeah. do what you want to do. Slow so, process. Well, not that you can't do what you've got to do now, but yep. 
um, yeah, onwards and upwards. Yeah. And I, I love the, the the attitude as well, the optimism. It's great. It's good Gotta to have see. It. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, otherwise you just dwell on it and and waste away. Yeah. You know, exactly. Where you could just be living life. So. Stacey, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. No worries. Thanks for having me.